So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Tari Hahnemann. Um, Tari is a Southern Californian having um, attended USC for her bachelor's and master's and worked for the California Endowment. But then she went east um, to work as director of the Health Equality Project for the Human Rights Campaign. For those of us who work in large healthcare organizations, this has been an amazing program because it really sets up our organizations to have targets to meet um, and recognition um, as they progress in caring for the LGBT community. So please welcome Tari. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I did actually used to work for the California Endowment, but I never actually worked in this building because we opened it about two months after I left. So um, this is officially my first, my debut working at the California Endowment. So I'm very excited about this. Um, so for, let me introduce the human rights campaign to you guys. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are the largest LGBTQ civil rights organization in the country with about two million members and supporters. And while most of you who do know of us probably think of us as a political and advocacy organization, which we certainly are, I'm somewhere in that crowd in front of the Supreme Court last year, we also have the Human Rights Campaign Foundation. And the Human Rights Campaign Foundation works with, um, to change the policies and practices in the systems and institutions that impact people's everyday lives. So their workplaces, uh, their places of worship, their schools, and where they receive their health care. And one of the ways that we do this is through our indices, like the Corporate Equality Index uh, or the Health Care Equality Index. We also have municipal and state equality indexes um, that look at those kinds of policies. And I want to take a step back and explain a little bit about how we got into this work um, with the Corporate Equality Index and the uh, subsequent other indices. In 2002, when we started the Corporate Equality Index, uh, LGBTQ people faced a very different landscape than they do now. As you can see, uh, there are a number of things that hadn't happened yet, um, a number of laws that hadn't changed, and it was not a favorable environment. We had a unfriendly administration and a split Congress. So we did not foresee being able to make progress on the federal level um, very well. So with that landscape in mind, uh, HRC decided to turn to the private sector, to turn to the nation's largest corporations and law firms, and work with them on implementing policies and practices in the workplace to change the lives of LGBTQ people. And the CEI has been a tremendous success in doing that. Um, in the first year in 2002, only 13 businesses scored 100% and got the best places to work designation, which is sort of the gold standard for corporations. Uh, this past year, 407 achieved that mark. And this is really critical and important because um, there still are no federal non-discrimination employment protections uh, for LGBTQ people. And only about half the states offer protections. So it's really important that workplaces are offering these kinds of protections. And based on that success, a few years later, we started the Healthcare Equality Index, which is an annual online survey um, that hospitals and other healthcare systems and uh, facilities use to improve LGBT care. And while the HEI does examine some of the workplace policies uh, that the Corporate Equality Index examines, we also look at policies and best practices directed more at patients. And we do this because so many LGBTQ people have faced discrimination in healthcare settings. You can see 56% of LGB people and 70% of transgender folks and gender nonconforming folks have faced some sort of discrimination in healthcare. This is from Lambda Legal's 2010 report when healthcare wasn't caring. Um, the types of discrimination, uh, being refused care, actual um, denials of care, healthcare providers refusing to touch people or um, taking excessive precautions, uh, harsh or abusive language. Uh, visitation denials, unease with same-sex partners, those are the types of discrimination that LGBTQ people face. 
And unfortunately, these experiences lead to significant fears around seeking health care. So um, LGBTQ people fear that they're not going to be treated properly, um, that their medical providers aren't going to know how to treat them. Um, those kinds of fears, uh, as well as the actual discrimination that uh, we saw earlier, um, are even more uh, egregious for transgender folks and gender nonconforming folks. Um, as you can see, they're, they're the green in the middle there, um, much more pronounced fears. And frequently, unfortunately, these fears lead to delays or avoidance of care, which is, of course, going to make any health symptom they are facing worse. So it's because of this discrimination that we started the Health Care Equality Index um, back in 2007. We did this in partnership with GLMA, which at the time was the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. And we did this to create a national standard in the treatment and care of LGBTQ patients and their families. Back then, we had about 10 recommendations for improving care. Uh, we have about 40 or so more uh, that we talk about now. But they included three key policy recommendations that we considered to be foundational for LGBTQ care, and we still promote today. That's having an LGBTQ uh, inclusive non-discrimination policy for patients, having an equal visitation policy, and um, having an LGBTQ inclusive employment non-discrimination policy. Um, and since we've launched the HEI in 2007, we have ha seen a tremendous um, shift in the social and political landscape. And that has held true in uh, healthcare as well, and we've made a lot of progress. And I want to touch on one of the stories that led to one of those changes. And actually, Dr. Robinson kind of stole my thunder a little bit um, and talked about this case. Um, and this is the, the Langben case, um, you know, around visitation. So, so Janice Langman and her partner Lisa Pond and their three children um, were in Miami getting ready to go on a cruise when Lisa had an aneurysm and was admitted to Jackson Memorial Hospital, uh, which is part of the Jackson healthcare system in Miami. And so, you know, as Dr. Robinson said, they were denied visitation for hours, even though they had all of the the legal documentation in place. They were told by a social worker that they were an anti in an anti-gay city and state and wouldn't be able to get any information or be acknowledged as a family. Um, after this um, happened, Lambda Legal filed suit. And this article appeared in the New York Times and was seen by the president and his staff. And he issued a presidential memorandum on visitation and said this should not happen. And so with that, we then, in 2011, got the condition of participation from um, CMS that said hospitals have to allow patients to have the visitors of their choice. They cannot deny visitation based on sexual orientation or gender identity. And they have to tell patients this. Um, so that was, that was very exciting. And as you can see on this timeline here, um, a lot of stuff happened in 2011. It was a really big year for us, um, kind of a boon year in LGBT health. That was the same year that the Institute of Medicine came out with their major report on LGBT health. Uh, also, in addition to the CMS Condition of Participation, or COP, uh, we had the Joint Commission uh, issue a similar standard and um, on visitation. They also um, issued, went a step for, for, further and issued a standard on non-discrimination and basically said that hospitals have to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Unfortunately, they didn't put a lot of teeth in that standard and they didn't require hospitals to have a written policy or to communicate that policy to their staff or their patients. Um, so that is still something that we are working on to get hospitals to adopt. We know that nearly 100% of the hospitals and healthcare facilities that participate in the Healthcare Equality Index have that policy in place and communicate that policy. Uh, because it's one of our standards. Uh, we have also done research, and last year's report we found about 750 hospitals where we found their patient non-discrimination policy. Only 58% of them 
where LG a lot of hospitals and healthcare facilities that don't have non-discrimination protections for patients written into their policies. Um, we've been pushing uh, CMS to get that um, a condition of participation. And this last dot on my timeline rec uh, reflects a um, draft of that uh, condition of participation that actually came out earlier this year. Unfortunately, it hasn't been finalized yet. And um, let's just say I'm not so optimistic that it will be finalized at this point, uh, unfortunately. So the other thing that is on here is the Affordable Care Act that passed back in 2010. Uh, some people call it Obamacare. Uh, so that back, passed back in 2010, and it had a non-discrimination provision in it uh, called um, that's kind of known as Section 1557. And then after numerous years, this earlier this year, uh, the HHS issued some guidance on Section 1557 that was really, really important and exciting. So let's just take a step back and talk about what Section 1557 is. It is the landmark non-discrimination um, provision of the Affordable Care Act. And it's landmark because of that word sex. This is literally the first time in um, federal law that a, in healthcare law, that there was a non-discrimination provision that included sex. So this room is majority women. This was really good for us. Um, you know, it, it required um, health insurance companies to, to not discriminate against women or charge them more. It required them to cover things like contraception and maternity care and a wide range of preventative services. So that was very exciting in itself and truly landmark. Um, but I've spent the better part of this year celebrating the guidance that came out in May around Section 1557 because um, HHS, Office of Civil Rights, interpreted sex to include gender identity and outlaw, outlaw discrimination based on sex, uh, gender identity and sex stereotyping. So that was really hugely tremendous because as we noted before, transgender people and gender nonconforming folks have faced the greatest discrimination in healthcare. Um, and this is really super wide ranging because it doesn't just apply to the insurers in the marketplace and those plans, it applies to any any healthcare provider um, program that receives any type of federal funding whatsoever. Any Medicare, Medicaid, they have a plan in the marketplace. It's huge. So very, very wide ranging, very exciting provision. There's just one problem. Yeah. So that's the problem. Um, now, What's really going to happen? We don't know. Um, the signs are not looking good. <laughs> um, it's certainly not going to be repealed on day one. Uh, it's going to take a while to untangle and replace. Um, but what we do kind of expect is that there's going to be a lack of enforcement of Section 1557. The Office of Civil Rights will probably be directed not to pursue these cases like they have been. Uh, we also anticipate more acceptance of religious accommodations and exceptions, uh, which, is, which is challenging given that the, the huge number of religiously based healthcare organizations out there. Um, so, and I also don't think I'm going to be adding any more dots to my timeline anytime soon, you know, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think we can count on this administration to have any federal policies or guidance that's going to be LGBTQ inclusive. Uh, so while we've made tremendous progress over the last several years, uh, we're back in a situation similar to where we were in 2002. We cannot count on the federal government to help move our agenda forward and to move these practices and policies in place. So we really need the private sector to step up and lead on these issues. And that's where you all come in. We need each and every one of you to make a commitment to adopting and promoting best practices in LGBTQ health. Uh, take the information and skills that you learned today and put them into practice. Become an advocate for the policies and practices that will improve LGBTQ health. So are you all ready to make this commitment with me? All right. So you guys, 
Well, I appreciate the applause. You guys have been awfully quiet and you're listening. Um, so I wanted to actually hear you say it. So I will adopt and promote best practices in LGBTQ health. Excellent. Thank you. I'm not going to make you say it 50 times like Bart had to. Um, and I, I really do thank you because we need you to do this because there's still so much fear out there and we need these best practices in place to mitigate these fears. So um, because despite all the gains we've made, years of discrimination and fear continue to leave their imprint. And so let me give you another example of that. Nikki Kwasny is on the left here in this photo. Nikki's wife Amy and her daughter are on the right. And in 2004, Nikki had stage four ovarian cancer. And one day she was having major pains and her oncologist told her to get to the emergency room immediately. But instead of going to a local hospital near their, hosp their house in Munster, Indiana, she drove alone for 40 minutes to a hospital in nearby Illinois. And she did this because she was terrified that uh, the hospital would not allow her and Amy to be together if she had a health emergency. Um, so even though CMS has this great condition of participation uh, that was passed and went into effect in 2011 that requires hospitals to have uh, allow patients to have visitors of their choice, people don't know this. I mean, who, know, who follows CMS conditions of participation, really, except for the compliance people? Um, so hospitals are required to tell patients this, but they usually don't do it until you've been admitted and you get a form in your packet. Uh, so one of the easiest best practices that we recommend is putting this on your website. You know, telling people that in addition to the visiting hours and that they probably shouldn't come if they have a cold, tell them that the patients get to choose who visits them and you're not going to discriminate against them. That's super simple. It takes about five minutes to, for somebody to make that change to a website. Um, and it goes a long way to helping people like Nikki know that they're going to be safe. So what are some other best practices? Um, the HEI is, is basically a, a catalog of these best practices, and it's a tool that, that healthcare facilities can use to, to measure themselves, see where, they're, where they are on these best practices, and learn about them. Um, I'm not going to go in depth on these, um, but I'm going to kind of go through them a little bit. We have them in four different categories. And a lot of these best practices come from uh, the Joint Commission uh, field guide that they issued in 2011. Uh, as well as things that we uh, read and learn about from uh, facilities around the country. Uh, I'll give a shout out to the endowment for funding this field guide a number of years ago. Um, it's great stuff still. Some of it's a little dated. Um, but so let's take a quick look at each of the sections of the criteria and what we look at. Um, the first section on non-discrimination staff training is, is really um, about those three foundational policies that I've already mentioned. Um, patient non-discrimination, equal visitation, employment non-discrimination, communicating those policies to your patients and your staff. And then the fourth is around training and helping those policies come to life by having well-trained staff. So I applaud all of you for coming to this event today and getting some of that kind of training. Uh, very important. And through the HEI, we provide free online training to staff at any of the participating facilities as well. Um, the next section focuses on LGBTQ patient services and support in these four kind of areas and categories. Um, it includes a wide range of best practices, um, like including LGBTQ people in your disparities planning, um, or looking at your clinical services and what you're offering and what you might be able to change to better serve them, um, offering specific LGBTQ health information, those wide range of things. Um, to better serve transgender patients, uh, we recommend having some specific policies and practices in place. And I recommend you use this guidebook that we created in partnership with Lambda Legal um, that has those policies and practices recommended. Uh, it's a great resource and is available online as well. Um, patient self-identification deals with collecting sexual orientation and gender identity data 
in health records. Um, as Dr. Robinson mentioned, very important to look at your intake forms, to have these forms, to collect that data, um, as well as to recognize non-traditional families in your, your forms. Um, and then finally, the decision-making practices, making sure that you're aware of everybody's decision-making rights and that that can include their same-sex partners. So the next section is on employee benefits and policies. And this is really important because LGBTQ employees um, of a healthcare organization can play a vital role in um, ensuring LGBTQ uh, patient-centered care. Um, and just like LGBTQ patients, the employees um, should receive equal treatment. And so uh, that we're looking at things like benefits, benefit parity for same-sex partners, um, specific questions around transgender employees, so having gender transition policies in place, having health insurance that affirmatively covers transgender uh, health care issues, um, and then having other things in place like employee resource groups or uh, pride events, et cetera. And then the last section in our criteria is around patient and community engagement. And this includes a wide range of things like um, having LGBTQ demographic data in your patient surveys or asking them specific questions about, you know, how their care was relative to their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, working with local community organizations, getting engaged with community organizations, offering educational programs to the community on LGBTQ health issues, or sponsoring, um, you know, your local pride event. That is a huge thing that we see our hospitals that participate um, doing around the country. And then finally, another form of community engagement is marketing and advertising to the LGBT community. And you can do this either through ads in LGBTQ publications or by inc incorporating LGBTQ images into your traditional advertising markets. So anybody recognize the health system here? Yes, Jackson Health System, sometimes a bad um, incident like that can create some great um, turnaround and change and reflection. And so Jackson Health System has been participating in the Healthcare Equality Index for a number of years and has been a leader in LGBT healthcare equality um, and is truly a leader in the field. Um, so uh, very different from the hospital that discriminated against Janice and Lisa. So my question, Wranglers. Uh, so thanks, that was really awesome. So the first question I'll have while I'm quickly reading these is, um, how can we find out if our organization is participating and how could we advocate if they are or if they're not? Excellent, good question. Um, so you can go online to um, our website, which is uh, hrc.org backslash HEI. Uh, there's actually a searchable map um, you can search both by state list, and we're working on actually improvements to the search functionality. But there's a Google map that I really love that includes both the uh, facilities that participate um, as well as all those facilities that we research. So we have nearly 2,000 facilities in there, um, and you can see whether or not they have those three key policies in place. Um, and then advocating, uh, you know, do your best internally to work your magic. You know, if you haven't. Uh, LGBT ERG on site, work with them, uh, you know, to help push this up. If you have uh, the ear of somebody in the C-suite, um, any, any avenues you can take to <laughs> promote this and get them engaged, um, we greatly appreciate it. And I'm always happy to talk to folks about helping promote um, the HEI within their facility. And I just want to point out Tari's contact information is in your folder, so, you know, please do that. Um, so really relevant to the talk you gave, aside from the possible repeal of the ACA, what other pro-LGBTQ rights or policies gained in the last 8 to 12 years can be easily rolled back or dismantled in the next 4 or 8 plus years? I read that verbatim. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, I <laughs> That we don't have time for that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, th there's, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think the executive orders, which um, the new administration has re uh, threatened to repeal, are huge. Uh, that includes uh, 
some employment protections for contract federal contractors. That's huge. Um, I mean, we we don't really think that um, you know they're going to take away the visitation rights. I mean that that would just really be a step too far. Um, but they could. I mean, they can any anything that's a regulation. They're going to have they they can change or not enforce. Um, we're you know we don't know what's going to happen with the military issues, particularly with with the transgender service being so new. Um, you know, there's just so many. There's been critical guidance that just came out on schools for trans kids um, that we're very worried about. Uh, just, you know, <laughs> I'll probably start crying if I keep talking about it. So there's a, there's a lot. So, but we will be there fighting um, every step of the way, and we'll be fighting to keep the ACA as well and those non-discrimination protections in place. And the next two things relate to our um, healthcare systems and environment. Um, and I just wanted to comment, I was reminded, part of um, our collaborative's efforts are going to be a, uh, a conference specifically for administrators. So again, if you have the ear of someone in the so-called C-suite, um, please let us know. We want to invite them, and we're going to be talking about issues specific to administration. Um, so the first of these questions is, can you suggest a way to get the executive level in a conservative organization to update patient intake forms and electronic medical record systems to start collecting information about sexual orientation, gender identity, trans identity, and et cetera? I need to convince them that this is important and relevant to the standard of care. Um, wow. Well, so we, we have some help. Um, the, the, the getting the, the SOGI data into um, patient records and EHRs is incredibly complicated uh, by just the sheer nature of EHRs. Um, so we actually have some help with the meaningful use guidance that has come out um, that is actually going to require uh, EHRs to uh, vendors to have that as an option. And so it will be a matter of it won't be you won't have to push back against the the cost and oh they don't offer this um, it will be there as an option for them in a few years and it will just be a matter of getting them to adopt it and collect it um, and in a conservative organization I mean I think really it it really is just about providing the best level of patient care possible um, and knowing your patients and knowing the demographics of your patients so that you can provide that care. Uh, so I think that's that's going to be the way to go, and it's the right thing to do. I don't know. I, I'm happy to talk more about that and, and maybe connect folks with other um, conservative organizations that might have adopted that. Um, and then the final question is, how can people keep their religious beliefs from interfering with caring for lesbians and bisexuals and being non-judgmental? Wow. <laughs> um, well, I think, so we work a lot. Um, we do have a number of religiously affiliated hospitals um, that participate in the Healthcare Equality Index. Uh, and basically, from what I have learned from them, it's, you know, their fundamental tenet is about treating people and caring for them and providing care. And so it's about providing care for people, the people in front of you. And, you know, um, they're human. It's, it's, it's sort of the golden rule. You know, it's like, you know, treat others like you would want to be treated. So it's, it's, um, I think that is the most um, important thing. And I think that's what we've found with folks that, that have strongly held religious beliefs, but still um, provide the best care possible. Uh, you know, and there's, there's a lot of things that where they, particular issues where they may not want to provide care, but, you know, a, a trans person going into the ER with a broken arm, it's still a broken arm. It has nothing to do with the fact that they're transgender. So, um, you know, that's that's the kind of care that uh, they, they expect to, to receive and, and that you would expect to receive, so. All right, so now we're going to get a 15-minute break. Stay up here just a sec, please. Um, we're going to get a 15-minute break, and uh, when you come back, you'll be able to see Sue Lavacare demonstrate the training that we're hoping you'll implement at your sites, and please thank Tari for that terrific talk. <laughs> 